Okay, so we are recording. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I can see people joining, so it's great to see uh, that we have lots of people entering the room. It is 10 a.m. here in Ireland, but I know we have lots of people from around the world, lots of different countries. So before we start, while we're waiting for people to uh, get into the room, uh, why don't you pop into the chat box where you're from and maybe tell us what time it is there, what the weather's like, what's going on where you are. So we're in Ireland, we're in Dublin. Um, Although Nadine is in Wicklow, uh, she's south of Dublin. I'm in Dublin and it's a nice, sunny, bright day. Well, there's some clouds, but it's bright. It's not raining, so that's good. Uh, so if you'd like to say hello and say where you... Okay, so we've got Lisa from Perugia in Italy. We have Alison from Dublin. We have Chiara from Milan. Uh, we have Marija from uh, Slovenia. We have someone from Krakow, Krakow. Um, we have Widad from Morocco, Orla from Dublin. Orla says it's pretty chilly, but at least it's bright. That's good. We have Maya from Israel, uh, Turkey, Russia, Istanbul. This is amazing. Uh, Claire from Barcelona. It's fantastic to see so many people. Lawrence, who's in Ukraine. Retha is in South Africa. Uh, Abir from Egypt. This is amazing. It's so good to have so many people from around the world. Um, Asia is in Italy. Berna is in Shankill, so very close by. <laughs> um, Ankara is from Turkey. So loads of people. So let's see. Um, we'll give it another minute or so, make sure everybody is here and ready to go. So before I introduce you to our speaker today, um, my name is Joanne and I will be moderating the webinar today. So I'll be looking at your questions and we will ask the questions to Nadine at the end of the session. So if you have any questions at all throughout the session, pop them into the Q&A box. So that's the best place to put them, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will get to those questions at the very end of the webinar. Nadine has a packed session today, so she won't be able to answer questions or respond to raised hands while she's giving the webinar, but we will get to them at the end of the webinar. So uh, I see we have a few more people in the chat. We have Tatiana from Russia. We have Rosella from Milan and we have um, a, an attendee from Siberia. Amazing. OK, so we'll uh, get started. I would like to welcome you all to the webinar today. We are very lucky to be joined by Nadine Early and Nadine is the academic director in ATC language schools. She has a master's degree in applied linguistics from Trinity College Dublin and she's worked in the English language sector as a teacher, trainer, materials writer and program developer for over 20 years. Nadine has delivered pre-service and in-service training in a variety of areas with, within second language education and she's delivered training on uh, subjects such as CLIL, language skills and systems development, task-based teaching uh, and learning, the lexical approach and developing learning strategies. So Nadine has a wealth of um, experience. And so we're really looking forward to the webinar today. And Nadine, uh, you can take it from here. I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, good morning from Wicklow, everybody. You are all very welcome indeed. Um, in today's session, we are going to look at some ideas for teaching and learning collocation, helping our learners develop their collocational competency. So this, uh, very quickly, the content of today's session, we will look at, well, I'll try to answer the following questions for you. What is collocation? 
Why is collocation important? What should we teach? And how should we teach it? So this last question I'm going to answer by looking at a few different areas. So we look at um, learner training and uh, developing some good uh, learning practices around collocation. Then we look at uh, just a few class activities that you can do with your learners. And we'll finish up today by looking at a few online resources that are available for teachers and learners. Okay, so what is collocation? Well, collocation is the way that words naturally combine together with greater than usual frequency. So here are three examples that I've taken from this presentation, bad habit, difficult circumstances, and provide information. A native speaker, or indeed a competent non-native speaker, um, has a vast number of these word combinations available for use, for retrieval and use. And of course, vast number is itself uh, a good example of a collocation. So we store in our minds uh, a lot of different information about each and every word that we have. Okay, so a, a, a competent user of the language will store so much information about a word in their uh, their mental lexicon. The mental lexicon is is the name we give to the dictionary that we have in our mind, in our brain, where we store all the information we have about the words that we have. So let's take, for example, the word help. What information does a, a, a native or competent user of the language store about this word? Well, apart from, um, you know, uh, the meaning of the word and, and, and a definition that they would have to hand, they would also have the following information. So they know how to pronounce the word, how the word is, is spoken. They will know that the word can be a verb or a noun. They'll know that as a verb, it is a, a regular verb. It takes ed in the past and s on the third person singular. They'll know certain uh, grammatical patterns about the word. So for example, you uh, help somebody with something or help somebody to do something. Uh, as a noun, they'll know it's variable and it's usually uncountable. So they'll know that uh, we cannot say, for example, he gave me two helps, right? But they'll know that it's also countable. And when it's countable, we use it quite often with the adjective great. He was a great help or big. He was a big help. But we also know that we don't use it with the adjective large. We don't say he was a large help. So even though elsewhere in our lexicon, we know that we can and often do use uh, great and big interchangeably or uh, great and large interchangeably, in this context, we cannot use large with the word help. At least we don't use it, okay? So just as a learner needs to be taught that help is a regular verb that takes ed in the past, he also needs to be taught that this is acceptable and this is acceptable, but this is not acceptable. So there are very many different types of collocations. Uh, we naturally combine different parts of speech to make collocational phrases. So as you can see, a very many of them are two word phrases, but commonly enough, we also have three word phrases, uh, acquire new skills, a highly irregular situation, and indeed four or five word phrases too. Collocations can be strong 
or they can be weak. So a strong collocation is when, with the presence of one word, we expect the presence of the other. So, for example, if you ask a native or competent user of the language, what word do you think will come after sibling? I will bet, I'll bet you that the majority will say rivalry. The same for mitigating. I think most people will say mitigating circumstances. And this is because these are strong collocations. The link between these two words is restricted. They don't really tend to turn up in the language with other words. Whereas weak collocations, both words can easily collocate with other words. So, for example, strong coffee, strong woman, black coffee, heavy smoker heavy load, lifelong smoker. So both of the words in the collocation can move about more uh, freely. So why is collocation important? Well, understanding what words combine and in what contexts is having collocational competence. And collocational competence is vital for having a communicative competence. Why? Well, collocation is fundamental to all language use. So two, three, four, even five word collocations make up a huge percentage of all naturally occurring text spoken or written. So estimates vary, but it is thought that up to 70% of everything we say, hear, read, write is to be found in some form of collocation or fixed expression. Uh, collocation develops fluency. So having access to multi-word units or, or chunks of language, as we call them, um, allows us to think more quickly and communicate more uh, efficiently. So native speakers uh, speak at the speed that they do because they can call on a vast repertoire of these uh, multi-word units or chunks of language. Collocation aids reading and listening. It allows us to read uh, quickly and listen effectively because we can recognize these multi-word units and so we don't have to process everything word by word. Collocation develops learners pronunciation. Because learners tend to create a lot of what they say from individual words, their stress and intonation patterns can be quite difficult for the listener. So if learners learn the stress pattern of the phrase as a whole, their stress and intonation will improve greatly. And finally, it brings learners from an intermediate level to an advanced level. We know that the principal difference between an intermediate learner and an advanced learner is not, in fact, a grammatical complexity, but is, in fact, the uh, larger range, the larger mental lexicon and range of vocabulary and multi-word items available to the advanced learner. Collocation contributes to meaning. The most common words have more than one meaning and we use collocation to uh, establish which meaning uh, of a word is intended or is understood. So an awareness of this and the importance of collocation in this regard helps learners answer questions such as, uh, what meaning do I want to express? And what is the most natural way of doing that? So, for example, 
mm, how do I express the idea of doing this noun? In other words, what verb should I choose? Or how can I add the idea of very to these adjectives without using the word very? At times, collocation is, uh, it not only contributes to meaning, but it is in fact central to meaning. So if you consider the word sick here, okay? So here we have three different meanings of sick. Uh, the first is, well, vomiting or wanting to vomit, okay? She became violently sick. Uh, the second then is the sense <clears throat> of having uh, an ongoing uh, illness or disease. And the third is the sense of being fed up with something, being bored or frustrated. In each of these cases, it is the collocation which tells us, the reader or the listener, which meaning of sick is uh, intended by the, the writer or speaker. So what should we teach? from a pedagogical perspective, what should we focus on? Well, I think uh, a good starting point is to conceptualize collocation as being on a continuum like this. Okay, so at this end of the continuum, we have very, very weak collocations. These are very freely combining words. These words, they both combine very, very freely with other words. And at the other end of the continuum down here, we have the opposite. We have uh, very, very fixed uh, expressions, um, often idiomatic uh, expressions. So we can argue that there's not much point in focusing on these very weak collocations because learners, even from a very um, uh, elementary level, can predict from either of these words, once they know the meaning of the words, can predict what the collocation is and can make other collocations very, very easily. Um, a good person, a good day, a good job, a good holiday, um, a nice car, uh, an old car, a red car, a big car, a small car. So it can be done quite easily. And uh, so it doesn't really justify spending too much time. We can also argue that these very, very fixed idiomatic expressions are not very frequent. So while we might do some work on them with very advanced learners because they want to be able to use idiomatic language, they aren't necessarily the most useful of collocations to be focusing on um, <clears throat> in the classroom. So I think really of interest to us as teachers are those collocations that fall around the middle of the uh, continuum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think we should focus on de-lexicalized verbs or empty verbs, as they're also called. So these are verbs that have little meaning when they're used alone, such as get, have, make, do, take. These verbs need to keep company with other words in order to th for them to have some meaning for us, to make sense for us. These verbs, although they are considered quite simple verbs by learners um, and they're, they're verbs that they will meet very early on in their language learning, um, they can cause a lot of problems for learners even at more advanced levels. So a lot of mistakes happen with delexicalized verbs, difficult to say, let's call them empty verbs. A lot of mistakes happen with empty verbs uh, because of what we call L1 interference. So L1 is the, the mo mother tongue. Um, so students will tend to translate directly from the mother tongue um, and you get things like this. So this is um, a uh, an example of what a Spanish speaker will often say, we took a coffee instead of we had a coffee. Another issue with empty verbs is uh, their avoidance. 
So learners at all levels tend to avoid them and tend to choose verbs which carry more meaning because they're well, they're easier to use um, if they're not too irregular. They're easier to use because they carry meaning inherently. They carry meaning. So you get this type of thing. Uh, we were late. When we arrived there, the film had started. Now, unlike this over here, this is not uh, incorrect. This is fine. This is grammatically correct. But it's not the most natural sounding of sentences. A more natural way of doing this would be to say we were late and when we got there the film had started. So focusing on empty verbs helps students move away from L1 interference, uh, draws their attention to it, um, and also encourages them not to avoid delexicalized verbs, embrace them. We should also consider collocation uh, when focusing on nouns as key words, either because we have uh, come across these words in, in the input, in a reading or listening text, for example, um, or because we are teaching them and we want the students to use them in their output, in their speaking or writing. So when we come across <coughs> abstract nouns, <coughs> excuse me, such as this one here, situation. Abstract nouns are a bit like empty verbs. They don't carry very much meaning when used alone. They need the company of other words to give them a, a context, okay? They need to be contextualized. And these type of abstract nouns tend to have a lot of uh, collocates. So to use an abstract noun like situation effectively, you need to know a lot of its adjective collocates. Then we have uh, more general nouns. Uh, take the noun job. Unlike an abstract noun, we, we know what this means when used on its own. It does have meaning, it does carry meaning. Um, however, it greatly helps our communicative purpose if we can qualify this noun, if we can qualify it concisely. We can communicate so much more about it. And then you get nouns like this, risk. So, here we have an example of a collocation, run the risk, which is quite frequent, but not very predictable. So if a student understands what the, uh, the noun risk is, they could very easily predict what to take a risk means, or even to put somebody else at risk. They might be able to predict this, but they might have trouble predicting what run the risk means it may not be uh, particularly clear. So if you have enough instances of a particular collocation, you think it's frequent enough, uh, but it's not very predictable, then I think it's worth uh, focusing on it um, in the classroom. Near synonyms, here's another thing we should focus on. Near synonyms are words that are very close in meaning. And um, as we all know, learners often have problems using words that are very close in meaning. Uh, words that are sometimes used interchangeably, but don't always collocate in the same way. So for example, <clears throat> We can say a gaping wound, <clears throat> but we cannot say, or we don't say at least, a gaping injury. We speak of an arduous task, but we don't speak of an arduous job. And we, uh, we can use final with answer, but we don't really use it with reply. So a final answer sounds okay, final reply, doesn't.
Uh, and then, of course, we have adverb and adjective collocations, and it's always worth spending time on um, exploring alternatives to very. With very many adjectives, you want to use very, but there are lots of other words with similar meaning, which are uh, stronger or more precise um, and more natural, and they are commonly used, for example, highly qualified or uh, bitterly disappointed. So you might want to focus on these, uh, particularly with intermediate level learners who need to be encouraged to move on from an over-reliance on the word very. And then finally, well, you can just look at your communicative goals for your lesson or for your activity. What is the language of the situation you're going to be focusing on in this lesson? Or the function that you're going to be uh, focusing on? Or indeed the uh, topic that you're looking at? So we've looked at the, 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 the what and indeed the why of collocation. So now let's look at the how, how to teach collocation. Well, the first and most important thing is to raise awareness of collocation among your learners. Learners naturally assume that the word is the basic unit of language and that in order to advance in a language, they just need to learn more and more words. They don't necessarily see that what they need to do is learn more and more combinations of already learnt words. So the collocational or the phrasal nature of language can seem strange to them. So teachers might need to, to do some groundwork on this. So the first thing to do, I always think, is teach the word. Some people avoid the word. They think it's too technical. But no, teach the word and make it part of your classroom language, your classroom vocabulary. If you need to introduce the concept, particularly with younger learners, I think the friends analogy is a nice way of doing it. Um, words just like people, don't exist in isolation. They like to keep company. Sometimes collocations are words that like to hang out together and sometimes they, you get two collocations that are like best friends and they're rarely apart. You always see them turn up together. Other collocations have a wider circle of friends and they tend to move around and hang out with other people. So in one text, you might see them in one grouping and in another text, you might see them in a different uh, grouping. But in class, we're going to sometimes work together on a word to, to look and to notice who they're friends with and indeed who they're not friends with. If you have a monolingual class, uh, use examples from the L1, from the mother tongue, um, as a way of discouraging over-reliance on direct translation. So to avoid translation, use translation. So many learners expect that because they collocate something a particular way in their L1, it will translate directly and correctly into English, but of course this isn't necessarily the case. So if we look here at this, uh, this collocation here, of course there's collocation in every language, um, this is Italian and I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe it translates directly into English as prepare or equip the table, but in English we don't equip the table for dinner. We set the table or we lay the table. Uh, this is Turkish, and in Turkish, we drink a cigarette, I believe, but in English, we don't drink a cigarette, we smoke a cigarette. So it's important that you encourage learners to see language as made up of these uh, chunks, uh, and that these chunks have a single meaning, and you need to help them translate the whole chunks back into L1, 
rather than focusing on translating individual words. Keep a record of miscollocations in your students' writing. So where students have translated directly from the L1, use these for a whole class consciousness raising activity where you ask, why were these errors made? What is the difference in how this concept is expressed in your L1 and how this concept is expressed in English? So the focus is on the concept or idea that is expressed in English and not the exact words that are expressed or translated into English. Train learners in dictionary use. Do class activities with dictionaries that will encourage and train students to look out for collocations in dictionaries and not just for a single word translation or single word meaning or definition, but uh, collocation too. So here's a nice, a very simple uh, class activity where students are asked to, to match um, an adjective with a noun and see how many combinations they can make. And once they've done this, then you ask them, go to your dictionary, find out are any of these combinations that you have found in your dictionary? What other examples or combinations are in your dictionary? And then again, bringing it back to the L1, how many of these combinations can be translated directly into your language and which ones can't? How do they translate into your language? Encourage noticing, and this is extremely important. Encourage learners to notice the cotext when reading. That is, the cotext is the words around another word, the words on either side of a word in a text, for example. Many learners, um, especially at lower levels, tend to focus on individual words that they don't know rather than collocation, rather than looking at the co-text. Um, many advanced learners tend to skip over words in a text because they think, well, I know that word, uh, so I'll just move on. And they move on without checking for collocates or without looking at the co-text. So both of these problems um, arise from poor learner training. Learners need to have collocations pointed out to them before they can be expected to notice them for themselves. So encourage learners to notice co-text when reading. Here's a very simple activity. Go to a text, underline all the nouns, then underline the verb which is used before the noun, which there, uh, if there is one, or it might be the adjective. Um, and then if, if appropriate, underline the whole phrase in which the collocation is used. So this reading activity is really just a training activity, training them to notice the collocations. I think it's a good idea to read texts aloud in class for your learners occasionally so that they can hear how, uh, the text correctly chunked. In hearing you read the collocations, they'll, uh, it will help them notice them to, to see them in the text. Uh, course books are uh, a great source for collocations. And um, so here you can see a number of collocations taken from a text about summer jobs from this book here, Outcomes. I just chose this book randomly and this text randomly and I just picked out these collocations. So all course books texts are really uh, full of really rich uh, and wonderful language. Um, and of course, Learners need to be encouraged to notice it, uh, to record it in notebooks, uh, translate the whole phrase back into the L1 and not word for word. Um, and then later they can come back and retrieve them again and use them in a speaking or writing activity um, about, for example, um, summer, summer jobs. Authentic texts are a really good source of collocation and provide students with uh, a really good opportunity for noticing collocations. Um, so here's a text uh, where this is a nice activity. It 
asks students to reconstruct the content of an authentic text just from a few words. So you find a few short texts, uh, one per group. Students have to read and extract exactly 15 words, which they write down on a page. Their list of words should have some two or three word collocations. Uh, they must choose the words that will give another group the best possible chance of reconstructing the text. Then groups exchange their lists. They work with their new lists to expand the 15 words into the story or what they think might be the story of the original text, which they haven't seen. Uh, it's a really nice activity. It encourages the students who are extracting the words to, to really notice the use of collocation to provide context and to convey very concise meaning in texts. Um, and of course, as well as encouraging noticing, we must encourage recording or writing down of um, collocations that students meet. Now, not every single one that they meet, because there are very many and we don't want to overwhelm them, so we do have to be selective. But writing them down is very important. We know that a single encounter with a, a word or a phrase is not enough to ensure that it is, it is learnt and that subsequent encounters are essential. Research suggests that up to seven more encounters with a new word, they have to meet the new word or phrase seven more times before they begin to really learn it. And we also know that learning is facilitated by revisiting items and using them again. Record, revisit, reactivate, and this is how learning is, is, is achieved. So this all suggests the, the need, the importance of recording uh, collocations um, into a, a notebook. And it's an integral part of learner training in the collocation rich classroom. These can be organized uh, in different ways. The, coll the, the collocations might be organized um, alphabetically, where they're uh, arranged according to grammatical relations. So we have the verb accept and its adverbs, um, the verb accept and its nouns. Or they might be organized uh, by situation, by function or by topic or any kind of combination of that that suits the individual learners. Um, a very common way of recording collocation is what we call the five one box. Um, again, uh, collocations uh, organized uh, according to their grammatical relations. So here we have the, the noun habit, verbs that go with habit, and adjectives that go with habit. And of course, you leave a few spaces at the end to add to these box as new collocations are met. Uh, then we have the visual organizer. This is a nice way to um, record collocations and to group them visually according to their meaning, um, according to the semantic relations between them. So here we have grouped together in blue um, collocations with habits that have a similar meaning to start a habit, develop, form, pick up. And here organized in green collocations that have a different meaning to end a habit, to break it or kick the habit or give up a habit. So this type of organization and recording is very good for more visual learners. And then we have the grid, uh, the near synonyms grid. Collocations grids can be really good for um, a visual representation of um, near synonyms, and collocates of near synonyms. Um, <clears throat> I think young learners could maybe add a little love heart or a smiley face to their grids to show that these two, these words here collocate together because they are really good friends and they love each other very much. 
Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, so we have 10 minutes. So um, I'm going to run through a few class activities that you, that you can do uh, with your learners before looking then at a few online resources. So here's a nice activity for looking at uh, de-lexicalized verbs. This uh, activity can be played at all levels and it's good because although the verbs are very easy, um, you can come back to it again and again with different level learners. So the, the verbs are written on slips of paper. The students sit in a circle and each person takes a turn to pick up a slip of paper, say the verb on it and make a collocation with it. And it goes round in a circle and everybody must do the same without repeating the same uh, combination. Everybody must choose a different collocation. Um, when one person cannot think of a word or combination, uh, they just choose a new slip of paper with a new verb and they go around again until all the slips of papers have been used. Um, so at low levels, you know, if you, you choose the word get, the verb get, you would expect, you know, get dressed, get washed, get a job. But with intermediate learners, you might expect the sense of become, so to get angry or to get fit or get drunk. Um, and then with higher levels, you'd be looking for, you know, get the impression or get the message or get on top of work. So as you can see, simple verbs, but can be used at any level. Here's a really nice activity for focusing on abstract nouns. Um, if you want to explore an abstract noun with your students, so you choose your noun, okay, and then using a collocation dictionary, uh, you choose about six adjective collocations from your dictionary and you write them on the board. And then students have to think of a real example of each of these from their own lives. And they write a sentence and or tell their partner about some of these uh, situations. And you can see there's some wonderful collocations here, a bewildering situation, a tricky situation, a tense situation. OK, it's really nice. This is a, a similar activity for focusing on abstract nouns, but it's more um, it's more learner centered because the the students have to select their own noun and then uh, search for collocations themselves. They're not given to them. So you give them a list of nouns. Each student in a group chooses one. OK, finds four or five collocations for that noun, and then they have to take turns in their group to mime the phrase, which is pretty difficult, um, or describe it without using the chosen words. OK, and the other students must guess what the phrase is. Here's an activity uh, which encourages students to consider adverb choices beyond very. Uh, it's really just a, a dictionary activity. They use a collocation dictionary and they have to add a word to each of these adjectives that means that has the same meaning as uh, very. And of course at the end you will always remind students when you put an adjective in your vocabulary notebook try to record a word with it which means very. Here's a nice uh, activity to do when you uh, meet the problem of near synonyms. Uh, students will often ask you the question, what's the difference between? What's the difference between answer and reply? And that is a difficult question to answer. And a good way of answering it is to explore the words that collocate with, for example, answer and reply. So here's a nice way of doing it. Read out a selection of about 10 collocates. Students write the two words in a column like this, in two columns. As you read out the words, the students have to listen and decide if the word goes, which column it goes into, if it goes into both or only one. Does it sound natural to them or not? And then obviously afterwards they can go to a dictionary to check and then they can keep this as a record or add it to a collocation grid. 
Of course, we should always explore collocation when preparing for a writing or speaking task. When we brainstorm uh, suitable vocabulary uh, at a pre-writing stage uh, of a lesson. All too often students focus on the, the key vocabulary for a given topic without looking at the collocates. And as a result, the range of expression is severely limited. Uh, analyses of students essay writing and exams often shows a serious lack of collocational competence. So students with good ideas lose marks because they do not know the four or five most important collocates uh, of a key word that is central to what they're writing about. And often without the right collocation, the precise idea cannot be very clearly expressed. So once you've brainstormed your list of key nouns associated with the topic, students should then be tasked with going to a dictionary and finding uh, adjective and verb collocates to help express their ideas better. Uh, this process should then produce a much larger and more phrasal uh, preparatory list for their writing than a simple list of key nouns. And of course, the same applies to uh, speaking. You might decide to input um, or provide some nice collocations, collocational languages for the students instead of sending them off to a dictionary to look them up themselves. And um, here we have um, a survey that was used as a priming activity for a reading. Students had to work alone to answer the, uh, the survey and then share their opinions with their partner in a speaking task before going on to read an article on this topic and compare their opinions with those of the writer. But just look at how many lovely um, collocations on the topic of drugs and whether or not drugs should be legalized in the criminal justice system there are in this short little um, survey for, for priming input. Um, and finally, in terms of activities, um, uh, recycling activities for collocation, the, the importance of repetition and reinforcement cannot be overstated or overemphasized. Remember, record, revisit and reactivate. So very quickly, here are six activity types that you might use to recycle collocations. Simple matching activities where collocations are divided, written on separate cards and alone in pairs and groups as a class, students have to match them together. Odd one out, cross out the word which does not belong in the group. Collocation grids, so when a grid has been completed, such as the ones we looked at for near synonyms, a new blank grid can be given in another lesson which students have to complete. Close activities, so a gapped reading text or transcript of a listening text. So half the collocation, you select a number of them, maybe not all of them, but a number of them, and you delete half of the collocation and leave a gap and students have to complete the gap. This is a really good way to recycle reading and listening texts used in a previous lesson. Um, and then we have board races. So teachers call out one half of the collocation and students work in teams to write the other half on the board. Maybe they get an extra point if they come up with a, a new collocation too. And finally, the backwards vocabulary test. I really like this. This is, well, traditionally learners are given a, a word and they have to supply a definition. But here they're given a definition and they have to supply the collocation. So these activities are all very good for recycling and for and for testing. They're mostly uh, passive, so they're good to do with learners at a lower level or learners where the collocations, they're, they're at a stage where they're only half learned or half known um, because for many of these activities, they don't have to actively produce the collocations for memory. They just have to recognize them. 
Okay, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I do want to have time for some questions and I see there are a few that have come in. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and really quickly go through some uh, resources with you. So I spoke a lot throughout the presentation about collocation dictionaries, go to a collocation dictionary. This is the dictionary that I use. It's the dictionary that I've always used. I, I, I love this dictionary, but it is a uh, paperback dictionary. Um, I did buy a class set of this for students to use in the classroom before the days of um, the internet being beamed into the classroom. Um, but of course, uh, there's no need to go to the expense <clears throat> of buying a, a paperback dictionary if you don't want to, because there are options of free online dictionaries available. So we're going to look at two of these now. The first is the Collins Dictionary. Here's the home page. This is what you see when you when you uh, log on here. When you type, go go to this link here. Um, you type the word you're interested in into this uh, English dictionary here. So we want to explore the word habit. You type habit in here, English dictionary, and here you get your dictionary. Your your dictionary definition of the word habit. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to come up here to this co-build collocations tab, co-build collocations and click on this. And when you click on this, you then get a list of words frequently used with habit and they are listed uh, alphabetically. Each of these uh, phrases is a live link. So if you uh, click on one of them, you get this. You get adopt a habit and a list of example sentences taken directly from the cobalt corpus of these collocations in use. The second dictionary then is the Macmillan Dictionary. Here's the home page. You go straight up here and you click on collocations. And you're brought to this page here where you search for, for your word alphabetically. OK, so I clicked on H. I was exploring the word habit and all the all the collocations that they have in the dictionary under H come up listed alphabetically. And here habit is the first in the list. OK, so each of these is a, a, a link. You click on your link and this is what you get. So you get words um, that collocate with habit listed according to their grammatical relations. Adjectives frequently used with habit, nouns frequently used with habit, verbs frequently used with habit. OK, and within these categories, words then with similar meanings are grouped together. So under adjectives here, you have adjectives that have the sense of being unpleasant, an unpleasant habit. You could choose any of these. Here you have three adjectives that have the sense of being a strange, a strange or unusual habit. OK, so they're grouped, first of all, according to grammatical relations and then according to meaning. And finally, um, this is not a dictionary, it's a collocation search engine called Just the Word or JTW. OK, it's a really nice search engine to explore uh, words. So you type your word in here and you click on combinations. And this is what you get. OK, so here we've looked for the word habit as a noun and we get this list here. So again, they are categorized according to grammatical relations. So here, I don't know if you can see this, it's quite small, but it's V ob OBJ habit, verbs with habit as the object, acquire a habit, become a habit, develop a habit uh, down here. A habit as the subject of a verb. The habit became, habit changed, the habit died. Um, adjectives with habit here, bad habit, nasty habit, and nouns with habit, okay, a drinking habit, eating habit. So this is just a, a, a zoomed in um, look at that, that page. So what you can do is what you can see is that phrases with a similar meaning 
with uh, semantic relations are grouped together into these clusters. So here, habit as a noun uh, has one cluster and they're grouped together and the sense is uh, to develop a habit or form a habit or get a habit, begin a habit. And then those that don't have sense relations are unclustered. These green lines are really handy because they indicate frequency of usage. So you know within this meaning or this sense for something to become a habit or get into habit are the most frequently used of all of them. So I just want to say that each of these then is a live link. The number in brackets, if you click the live link, you get example sentences of it in use taken directly from the British National Corpus. And the number in brackets tells you um, how many example sentences you are given. So if you click on acquire habit, there are 20 sentences here uh, taken from the British National Corpus. So these are really nice for teachers and students who want to spend a little bit of time either in class or at home and um, exploring words and getting a sense of how they are used naturally in um, spoken and written text. OK, so here are my uh, my references and resources. This uh, presentation will be made available uh, to you afterwards next week, I think. So if you want to come back and have a read through these or look at any of the activities um, that I rushed through, uh, it will be made available to you. So if you would like to connect with ATC, um, you can visit us here and um, you can email us visit us at our website, atclanguageschools.com. Um, please do check out our blog, ELT Connect. This is a great resource for teachers offering uh, free resources, materials, lessons, lesson plans. Uh, and it's a nice opportunity to network with other teachers from around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. That was so interesting. Uh, absolutely brilliant. I think we got loads from that. And as I said at the beginning, a packed webinar. There was so much information in there. And we had lots of questions asking, can we get the recording? Can we see the slides? So I'll um, redirect you again to eltconnect.com. By Thursday, this uh, webinar recording will be up there and you'll be able to watch it through. So that's, uh, that's where we will publish this webinar. But also on Thursday at 1 p.m., we are going to have a Facebook Live. So you can join us on Facebook, 1 p.m. GMT, and we're going to talk about the main takeaways from uh, this session. Um, so we're getting some lovely um, messages in. Thank you all so much for your feedback. It's really nice to see so many nice comments. Um, that was a really interesting um, webinar full of really good information. And I have two questions. I think we have time for them. Uh, Keith Yearwood would like to know when we're talking about uh, collocations, for example, the word sick and the, the meaning around the word sick, do you think it's important to also bring in the informal meanings into class? So for example, a lot of people use sick as something that's really good. Do you think that's important to include in lessons? Keith, that is a really good question. And you know what, when I was doing up that slide, I actually initially included uh, sick with the meaning good. Um, and then I decided to take it out and I'll tell you why. So for those who aren't aware, um, uh, younger people in English can use the word sick in British English and American English, I believe, to mean something is really good. So oh, that was sick, it was brilliant, it was great. Um, so it has the completely opposite meaning to what we looked at. Um, I think that almost falls under the kind of idiomatic. I think um, 
initially with students, uh, it's maybe not such a good idea to go there. When I say initially, I mean with, with lower levels, um, just in order not to confuse them. Certainly from intermediate and above, I would probably bring it in. Um, but that depends. You need to make decisions. And it's a constant thing. You're constantly making decisions very often on the spot about how frequent a word is. Will the students come across it and will they need to use it? So if in your context you're working with teenagers and you think this will be of use to them, then sure, absolutely bring it in. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And we have a final question. Um, is there a way that you can suggest for teaching phrasal verbs? Now, that's a long answer. But <laughs> Well, um, look, you know, it's 11 o'clock, so I don't think I have time really to, to go into that. But I will say this, that I wouldn't get too caught up on um, the, the grammar of these collocations. Um, I think we can overwhelm ourselves as teachers and overwhelm our learners by overanalyzing the, the, the phrases and, and looking at the component parts and the the, 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 the prepositions and all the rest. Um, I think phrasal verbs, like any collocation, are just thought um, as, a, as, a, as a whole, as a phrase. And, um, you know, th there are different approaches to doing that. You can uh, start with, with the verb itself. So start with take or put, for example, um, or you can contextualize it and look at phrasal verbs that we would use uh, within a particular topic or context. And personally, that is the approach I would take. I would look at the phrasal verbs that commonly crop up in a particular context um, or topic, um, and then just treat them like any collocation as a whole phrase that should be learnt, recorded, translated directly, or translated the sense of it uh, back into L1, but not necessarily word for word. And I wouldn't get 